Hi, and welcome to How to Make Better Products with Android Things. I'm Kristen, and I'm UX lead for Android Things. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the UX design manager for Android Things. Uh, you can think about this talk as product design 101 for people who may not be designers. But if you are a designer, we got you covered. Uh, we'll be covering hardware prototyping and the possibilities of what you can create using Android things. Uh, in this talk, we'll cover uh, how you can accelerate the prototyping and product creation process uh, using Android things. We'll talk about a design framework that you can use starting today to help you think about who your users are and how they can play a more prominent role in crafting the products that you're creating. Uh, and we'll also talk about a concept project called Lantern to demonstrate how we've applied the design framework to use Android things to create better products. Thanks, Michael. So we know that hardware design is a long and difficult process. It can take anywhere from two to five years to bring a product from ideation all the way up to product. So you start with ideation, and then you move on to the prototype phase, and then you choose your hardware, and then you design your software and get that all coded up, and then you send it to a factory, you finally get it on the store shelf, and then you cycle back and you have to go through updates. So we live in a world that's rapidly changing, and technology can change right in the middle of your production process. So how can the design process keep up? That's one of the main reasons that we created Android Things. It's made for a world that's rapidly changing and enables people to be part of the creation process from ideation all the way through maintenance. So at the heart of Android Things, there's something called a SOM, or a system on module. Okay, and this is also called a carrier board. The SOM can be used for prototyping. And it can be also placed on a custom board. So you can snap this SOM off and use it on your own custom PCB board. Okay? And this carrier board, everything that surrounds this carrier board is an accessory. So everything from Ethernet to power to the headphone jack over here, um, this is a powerful tool for prototyping because you already have a lot of tools that you need to get connected. And of course, if you need a different peripheral, you can easily connect it using traditional methods like pins, a breadboard, and resistors. So Android Things offers a number of tools for you to get started easily. There is the kit, which has an IMX7 developer board, a touch screen, and a stand. So for those of you who have gotten your kit already or have maybe been to some of the code labs, uh, the kit assembles into a useful stand that you can use to prototype right on your desk. In addition to the kit, we offer the Android Things Toolkit app to help you get onto Wi-Fi really easily. One of the pain points that we heard from developers in the code labs at DroidCon, for example, was provisioning the devices onto the Wi-Fi network was difficult. So with the Toolkit app, you can get it onto Wi-Fi um, with a, in a breeze. Uh, it'll also step you through the process of making sure that your hardware is connected correctly. And with recent updates to the Toolkit app, we also have some samples that you can load from the app onto your device to see some of the powerful things that Android Things can do, like running the TensorFlow demonstrations before you get into uh, Android Studio. Uh, in addition to the Toolkit app and the hardware kit, uh, we also recently updated the AndroidThings.withGoogle.com community hub. So now we offer code snippets, samples, drivers, and projects from the community. So if you do build something cool, you can submit it, uh, and we'll feature it on the site. Uh, we also recently updated the site to include driver submission, so that if you do write a cool driver and you do want to submit it for other people to use, we can have that on the site as well. Uh, if you haven't already gotten your kit, head over to the I.O. Dome, and they'll give you information about how to get one. Thanks. So Android Things provides an end-to-end -end solution. It offers tools from prototype to production, as Michael mentioned. The SOM makes hardware selection easier by offering modular hardware solutions, so you can use the same SOM for prototyping as you do production. For prototyping, the kit offers peripherals such as displays, a camera, a rainbow hat for sensor input and interface output, and also an antenna to connect the device to Wi-Fi. An app also makes this easier, as Michael mentioned, to assemble your hardware. And it also helps you get familiar with your carrier board, and it helps you connect to Wi-Fi. And finally, when you're ready for production, the developer console can help you create builds, configure your firmware, and release those builds to devices. 
Great. So we wanted to share with you uh, a concept uh, called Lantern. And we're using this as a demonstration to, to uh, help you understand how we were able to use Android things to bring um, products to life. So Lantern is uh, not a Google product, but it's a project that we worked on um, with the Nord Group that creates augmented reality anywhere around you. And so you can see this as an, a, an easy an easy to understand example of how we were exploring creativity through prototyping. And again, we wanted to show you the possibilities of what you can create, or what we can create, or the possibilities of what can be created with Android things. So at its heart, Lantern is obviously a lamp. But it's a lamp that enables you to create augmented reality anywhere around you. And it's, it's created using off-the-shelf parts. And we thought that was really important because we wanted to make sure that as a recipe that you could potentially build one on your own. So what is augmented reality? You may have heard this term, AR. There's the AR kit. Um, but how can we create this sense of augmented reality using Android things? So using Lantern and Android things, we wanted to project onto everyday objects interesting pieces of information and content that may be trapped inside the phone or on the web, but that may enhance the world around us. So say, for example, here, um, the currently playing cast song, we're projecting it onto a speaker. And none of this was done using After Effects. This is all using the projection system and the prototype that we created. Um, another example of how we're augmenting everyday objects is, um, uh, in this example, a clock. So we're using Google Calendar uh, and a wall clock uh, with Lantern to project the calendar information around the clock. And again, this is all real. We shot this in the studio using the projected lan um, using Lantern. Um, as an exploration here, we felt like it looked particularly good because it was on this nice curved round surface. So it gave this ticker, ticker tape kind of uh, look. Um, but we're excited about these possibilities. And that's why we wanted to create this to share with you to demonstrate not only our design process, which we'll get into, but also to give it to the community to see what you guys may want to create with it. And so what is Lantern made of? I mentioned before that it was created using off-the-shelf parts. So there's a lamp. Inside is a laser projector, an accelerometer, a 3D printed housing, and Raspberry Pi running Android things. Uh, it's important to recognize that there are two pieces of hardware that Android things, two boards, excuse me, that Android things runs on. It'll run on uh, a Raspberry Pi, uh, and it'll also run on the IMX7 boards that are in the, that are in the kit. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is, is a little bit more prevalent at this point uh, in the maker community. So we felt like building it on that platform with the HDMI output was going to be better for this case because we could connect it directly to the laser projector. And so once it's assembled, it looks like this. Uh, you may have seen it over in the IoT dome. We have one running over there uh, as an example. And we really believe that um, this is only now possible because of the democratization of design, and hardware, and prototyping, and access to these kinds of tools that we're talking about today. So it was really difficult in the past to, say, print a 3D form like this and assemble it into a hardware shell. Um, because hardware was expensive, 3D prototyping tools were inaccessible, and tools like Android Things were not easily uh, readily available for you to access to create new hardware prototypes. And so Lantern can also be assigned um, content to its, its particular context. So it's aware of its orientation. And so using that accelerometer in Lantern, we can change its uh, base position and then project different content onto different surfaces. So say we wanted to project a star chart on the ceiling, or in the examples that we saw earlier, you could see the uh, calendar information projected onto um, the wall. Uh, this code is available today at github.com slash nordproject slash lantern. Uh, if you want to check it out, uh, download the source code and build your own. So we didn't set out to create Lantern. So where did Lantern come from? You can see a number of sketches that we created. And if you're designers, you may be familiar with ideating through sketching. But we had an inclination that projected systems would be interesting when we started prototyping using Android things. Uh, but we used design to turn I our idea into a real thing. And today we want to share with you the process that we went through and the frameworks that we used to create amazing products so you can too. Thank you. 
So as Michael mentioned, design helps create better, better products. How many of you, with a raise of hand, have created something that was used by another person? Go ahead and raise your hands. Oh, that's awesome. So when we design things, you might know that we use common principles to ground our work. A lot of the things that we design can be carried over from software into hardware, from a banking app, for instance, to a theater app is another instance. So we use these processes and, pr and principles to ground our work, but then we use the design process to move forward as well. And then we continue iterating. With Android Things, we're taking some of the software UI design concepts and applying them to hardware. So what is design? Design is the creation of tools for people in a context to help them achieve a goal. If any of you are familiar with the development process, this is very similar to a user story. So for example, as a dog owner, I want to, I want to connect a dog feeder so that I can feed my dog from work. Or as a person who orders pizza, I order pizza all the time, I want visibility into the delivery route so I know when my pizza will arrive. Or something like a simple story. As a knight, I want a stronger sword so that I can defeat the dragon. Now, taking the knight example, we framed out that the knight wants a stronger sword. This is a tool that the knight uses to achieve his goal of defeating the dragon. We call this tool an interface. So people, people typically think of a user interface as a touch screen or a mobile phone or a tablet because you can tap on the screen and things happen, right? It's magic. And while this is true, user interface is much broader than that. Like in the example I used before, the user interface is the sword. But we can see here from this slide that a button can be used to build upon an interface to create a joystick, which can be used to create uh, a game that shoots down aliens from the sky. And then there could be feedback on top of that where there's LEDs inside of a breadboard that light up when you push the button, right? So all of these are an example of a user interface. But one of the most simple user interfaces that uh, we use to design things is simple as a piece of paper and a pen. And admittedly, a design is iterative, and sometimes it feels like this, right? Like the, like the hamster in the wheel. That's OK. The truth is, is that you're never done. Teams need to collectively learn through the experience of observation and iteration. That being said, Android Things enables you to iterate faster by allowing you to work through many design issues uh, by using the design kit as a base for your prototype phase and allowing for early over-the-air updates using the developer console. So design is a process that can be used to create better products for everyone. And we know that design is agnostic of medium, time, trend, or technology company. And we believe it's important to think about design as a process that's agnostic of these things. So no matter what changes, you have the right tools to apply that process when um, whatever problem you're working on. So we talked about design being uh, a in the context of people, or people in the context of uh, goals. But how is it done, and what does it look like? So each milestone outlined here, planning, prototyping, getting feedback, and iteration, uh, needs to be vetted. Right? And using this iterative framework, we can enable this to help us make less mistakes, uh, produce better products, and have a cheaper production process along the way, because we learn earlier how the product needs to take shape as it's evolving. This will truly help you make decisions sooner. So thinking about planning. Um, planning takes the shape of many forms. Um, first, we aim to create baseline understandings of needs that may exist for our users. So we may begin by talking to people about pain points or getting inspiration from places from pain points that we have ourselves. We may look at competitive products to think about how they are solving specific problems and how we may want to do things differently. Uh, if you're familiar with design for software systems, you may be familiar with creating user personas to get an, an idea of how you can gain empathy into the mind of somebody who's actually using your product. Uh, we also create things like wireframes, storyboards, to begin to tell the story of how we're seeing the product's use unfolding over time. 
Um, we then create something, right? So based on what we know and the hypothesis of how something should work, we begin by creating medium fidelity designs. So we saw those really preliminary sketches, right? Uh, we may create something like a video simulation to think about how it might look and feel before it actually works. Uh, we might make something um, on a breadboard to get an idea of what it functionally might do or what some of the key characteristics of that functionality uh, might be like. And then finally, getting feedback. So it's important to, uh, to get feedback uh, in this cycle because we need to understand how people are actually using things. So qualitative feedback, understanding the user's perception of how they feel about a particular feature or what you're proposing. Uh, quantitative research, we can be used to gain data to understand how specific features are, are being used or not used. Uh, internal feedback, we're constantly sharing projects with each other internally to get feedback from other people. It's really helpful to get an objective eye on something so that, they can, so that that person can point out something that you may not have seen. Uh, and guerrilla research, um, showing your prototype to somebody who may not be familiar with the project can give you tremendous insight because then you can have an objective set of eyes on, on features that you may be creating from somebody who may not be familiar with the project before. And finally, in later stages, you may employ something like a lab study, more formally to ask participants to use your prototype to see in a controlled environment, side by side, what different variations may be like. And we're not saying that you need to do all of these things along the way. So for example, we may create a rough storyboard, um, which can then translate to a click-through and then gain internal feedback and iterate on that cycle. Or, for example, we may do a bit of competitive analysis um, or define some must-have requirements and then create a looks-like, feels-like prototype and then perform some guerrilla research with somebody who's not familiar with the product we're creating. So something else to mention is that hardware isn't hard. It's just different. You need to consider what parts that you need to make what you want. You also need to think about designing a system possibly with non-customized parts. Sometimes it's like Jenga. One requirement can actually affect another. And you also need to think about future-proofing. How much space do you need to allocate for user data, for example, if you're designing a camera? This might be important for users. And finally, you also need to think about form factor. How will, how will all of the parts that you want to fit into your design fit into a form factor that's delightful for your users? One other thing to consider is your interaction design. So when you, when you connect the product to the internet, do you make a companion app for that? How do you make sure that the notifications can be seen from a reasonable view? How do you make it accessible? Take something as easy as a software update. Do you tell the user at 8 AM when people are actually using your product? Or do you wait until 2 AM when people might not be using your product and they might be asleep? Also, what if there's no screen? Something else to consider for the land of IoT. So we can apply our design process using Android Things to help us iterate faster and get, back feed get that feedback sooner, make better informed decisions for these questions, and also ultimately help us design better products. And one thing to note, if you're a software designer, something that you're really familiar with is the undo button. In hardware, you don't have an undo button. It's really difficult to roll back a release. Sorry, it's really easy to roll back a release when you're a software engineer as well. But when you're designing for hardware, it's a lot more permanent. So you need to have a strong iteration cycle. Because each time that you move forward in your design cycle, the more expensive it go gets to move backwards. For example, in 1966, NASA's budget was over 4% of US spending. And the undertaking was mammoth. Now, for example, we can shoot 3D printers into space, assemble technology up there, update it from your laptop, and reuse the rockets all at a fraction of the price. We can shoot cars into space simply because it's fun and because we can. One other thing to note here is the design process. So with the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions, they were all built to get us to the moon. Mercury put a man into space, Gemini to extend, the, to extend the capsule stay from hours into days, and the Apollo to get us to the moon. 
These were some pretty big iteration cycles, but you know they were really onto something. You may also notice that even today, some hardware design is actually based on a waterfall process. It requires everything to be perfect and is expensive in end-to-end -end cycles. So for example, you start with your requirements, you hand those off once those are done to the designers who finish the designs, and then they hand that off into, to the engineers for implementation. Once the implementation is finished off, then they hand it off to the QA engineers for verification, and then you uh, cycle back through a maintenance cycle, and you do that over and over again. And if you make a mistake or you decide that you want to change, if you're late in the process, you have to go all the way back up to the requirements section. So on the right, you'll see something that looks a little bit more like the process that Michael was talking about, only except we have a few more milestones sprinkled in there. So each one of these is an iteration cycle. You plan, prototype, feedback, and iterate. And you keep continuing to do that throughout your, your process. Iteration is flexible, and it helps keep costs contained and the users included in the process. In the past, there were also very specific roles that contribute to the creation of a project, including fabrication engineers. Now, with the access to tools like on-demand 3D printing, product creation has become more democratized, as Michael mentioned before. Anyone can print 3D parts. Designers can code visualizations now with the ease of prototyping tools. App developers can also apply their skills to hardware. And Android Things makes that easy to do so. Specifically, we're dealing with software. In the past, it was also labor intensive to create and release a build. And it was difficult to set up testing environments for those devices as well. With Android Things, we've introduced the developer console so that users can update their app in Android Studio, open up the dev console, and create, and build, create a build and release it, all in a few easy steps. So now that we've talked a little bit about design and process, um, we want to bring this back to the Lantern project that I mentioned earlier. So how were we able to use the process of planning, prototyping, getting feedback, and iterating to help us improve this concept? Um, we were able to think about people, context, and, and goals, and then apply this to the simple idea. So as a designer sitting at my desk, I'd like to bring my room to life through projections. Simple idea that connects people, context, and goals. We started by sketching, but what happened next? We began to create a looks like, feels like prototype. So before we were even assembling hardware or putting together the housing, we started to think about what would a time rendering look like as a projection if it was sitting next to me? Or what would I want to project onto um, the desk in front of me as I was typing? Um, would it be? Um, some Bitcoin uh, information, or a price of something else, or how I'm doing in a certain game. Uh, a looks like, feels like prototype can help you understand how something, how, how something exists in its end state without actually having to get there through the full creation process. So again, we went back to sketching to think about uh, how the housing may come together. Right? If we were thinking about a lamp and thinking about the parts that needed to go in it, well, we, as I mentioned earlier, we'd need the Raspberry Pi board, we'd need some sort of projector, and it would have to start to fit inside of this specific shape. And this was one of the first prototypes that we created using foam core and some of the parts. So once we knew the parts that we needed, we began to put them together and assemble them not into a 3D print right away, but just using foam creating slices, cutting them out, and making the form so that we knew that they would fit into um, the lamp. And before we put everything together, uh, we started to prototype what some of these content simulations may look like functionally. So on the left, what you're seeing is an accelerometer test showing how we could change content based on orientation. And again, it's really simple. We had the projector. We had the Raspberry Pi connected to uh, an accelerometer running Android things. And we just said, can we show you the direction or show us the direction of which way the object is pointing? So does it know if it's pointing up, down, or sideways? And then on the right-hand side, these were some of the initial tests that we did looking at how we could get the currently playing song off of the Wi-Fi when you're casting to a, a nearby device and just projecting it onto a notepad to see, is that even possible using the hardware that we think we want to use? Looking at physical prototyping, uh, here's Joe uh, with the first assembled prototype. 
uh, looking at the accelerometer, changing the content based on the orientation of the physical prototype. And here, it flips up at the ceiling. And then you can see the content start to come to life. So again, we built these pieces up individually and then started to put them together into their final form. So one tool that I wanted to mention that the team found highly beneficial uh, in creating this project uh, was processing. And so if you're a designer, you may already be familiar with processing as a lightweight IDE that enables you to quickly create visualizations. Uh, for designers like me, it helps me because I can create visualizations independently. And there's a really nice library that was re recently released from the Processing Foundation um, called Processing for Android. And what that enables you to do is write processing and then test that in, on an Android device. You can test that on your phone. You can test that on your Wear device. Uh, but you can also use that on Android things, which is really nice because you can work on a visualization and then load that onto your hardware independently. Uh, what this enabled us to do was work with the visualizations, get them to a place where we wanted them, and then integrate them into the hardware. Um, a few gotchas. When you're moving from uh, processing, you can export an Android Studio project. However, uh, you'll need to upgrade the minimum SDK version uh, in the Gradle file in order for you to work with Android things. So Android things requires a slightly higher Android build number. And um, once you do that, you'll be able to connect your processing visualizations to hardware to manipulate them um, through the standard Android Things GPIO um, inputs. And so thinking about our iterative process, how did we go about getting feedback on Lantern? So first, we started asking team members around us to use it. We couldn't really go out to the public because this was a private thing that we were working on. Um, but we were able to find other people inside of Google who are not familiar with the project, um, team members such as the ML team on Android Things who thought it was pretty interesting. But one thing that we had really kind of pushed away from was the idea of integrating inter interactivity into our MVP, or our first iteration of the project. We were specifically adverse to incorporating interactivity because we wanted to prove that we could project content in different ways. Uh, interactivity adds another layer of complexity. So again, we wanted to simplify this into its basic form so that we could prove that the independent um, interactions were working. However, when we shared the prototype with the ML team, uh, they were really keen on integrating a camera. And so uh, because we were working with Android things and working with uh, 3D printing, we were able to make some modifications, uh, integrate the camera. And uh, the Nord team happened to be working in London. Uh, and the Mountain View team was over here. And it was really an interesting story of how this evolved because, again, never before have you had access to tools like this, like 3D printing from the web. Uh, we were able to actually build prototypes in two physical locations and collaborate on them and build them up simultaneously, which is really cool. And again, Android Things made it really easy to integrate new hardware like this and connect it to the visualization pieces um, in a snap. And so with the camera in place, we now had the possibility of a greater range of interactivity and interactive input. And so this led us to creating Quick Draw pen and paper edition. So for those of you who were at I.O. last year, you may have seen uh, Quick Draw, uh, which is a Creative Labs project from Google that uh, prompts you with a word. And then as you draw it on a tablet, on the web, or on your phone, it starts to guess what you're drawing. And we thought that would be really cool to do in the physical world now that we had this projected AR system. And so what we did is um, we did just that, right? So previously, it was limited to screen-based inputs. Uh, but we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could use just a pen, paper, uh, capture that input, feed that into the QuickDraw engine, and then have an interactive game uh, that you could use in the physical world? Uh, this is an example uh, of the demonstration that we have set up over in the IoT dome. If you haven't visited the dome, you can check it out, and you can try it out for yourselves. We've got a lantern set up, uh, and it works, it works great. So you're prompted with a word. And as you start to draw with the pen and the paper, uh, it starts to guess on this projected interface in front of you. So again, thinking about this as a mixed reality surface. Uh, and there you go. So now we've gone one 
through one cycle, right? We've planned, we've prototyped, and we've got feedback, and we've iterated on that cycle. We made some improvements. And so we're done, right? Uh, we're ready to ship no, the project. No, 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 no. We're not going to ship our product yet. <laughs> so. so what we're going to do is start the production process. And so what this means is we're going to move forward uh, maybe mass producing something like Lantern. So Android Things has many prototyping tools to get you started. After you've completed your proof of concept and the initial prototypes, everything is working, and you know what you want it to look like, and you know you want to move over to a custom board. Um, this is easy because of the SOM, like I mentioned before. Um, you shouldn't have to redo all of the work that you did in the prototyping phase just because you're using the same architecture to create your products. So now let's say that I want to mass produce Lantern. right? And um, as part of the feedback process, I wanted to learn more about factory production and bring up processes. So I visit a few factories in China. As it turns out, they have a process too. And it maps well to the overall product design process. When you mass produce a product, the factory will build out a line with stations. Each station is staffed with people who put together the product. If I want millions of products or millions of lanterns, the factory might automate that process and make some really cool robots and automate things with conveyor belts and those robots. During the whole process, though, it's good for you as a product designer to continue iterating on your product, but probably leaning more towards software instead of hardware changes. And I'll show you why. So you've created. 10 units, perhaps, in your prototyping phase, right? And then you send those off to the factory. And they're, they're going to run everything through something called a validation test. And you start out with engineering validation tests. So you send your prototypes to the factory, and they'll send back maybe 100 units. And during that time, you need to make sure that everything works with the materials that you've selected. They're probably going to be using soft tools, possibly hard tools in this stage, to create all of the forms for your, um, your industrial design. And then after that, after you've verified everything, then you send any feedback back to the factory, and you move on to design validation test. This is where you move on to stainless tooling. All of the stations are set up, and they're staffed with people. And at this point, the product design team should be using Android Things Console to update software and update all of the testing channels to help make your iteration cycles go better. In the meantime, you should also be doing user testing throughout all of these phases. Then when you have feedback for the factory and you send things back, um, then you move on into the product validation test. This phase makes sure that everything is moving as fast as possible. This is more for the factory than for you. They'll send you back around 1,000 units. And there, you should be continuing to use the console to run and test metrics on these devices. And finally, for mass production, you should be using the um, developer console to send any zero updates if needed and gather more metrics on these devices. So as you can see here, as you move through the process, uh, they should be sending devices back to you the whole time. And you should be testing those devices, giving feedback extensively through QA. And one other note from a design perspective, as you move forward through this framework, your solutions might need to get more creative, more macgyver and lean more towards software solutions, because it might be too expensive or too late to go backwards and start over again if you're working with a product team. So some of the tools that you can use to make this all go a lot smoother is the developer console. So we've included something new called the app library. This allows you to add apps to your, you can this allows you to add apps to the app library and use them on multiple projects. So if you have multiple lanterns, for example, you can write one APK, upload it to the app library, and then you can use it throughout each of your different products. When you're ready to test over the air updates, you can create releases and channels. And so or, sorry. When you're ready to build, you can actually uh, go through and use the um, you can use the build settings, and then you can create a build individually and run through each of the steps to set all of the firmware and software for your device, and then you create a build very seamlessly. Oops. And when you're ready to test over the air updates, you can create releases and channels. 
you can push those releases to channels so you can test your software in different groups for detailed testing. So for example, here, I'm creating a custom channel. I'm creating an update. And I'm going to push these updates to my devices or my fleets of devices wirelessly. And finally, after your release, you can gather metrics to help you gather quantitative data on your products to help you make better decisions about what you need to do next. So for example, in Lantern version 0.1, you have maybe a, a, set, a set of features that you want to use. And then you want to move on and add quick draw. You can do so fairly easily by using the build tool. And then you can check in metrics to see if it's doing better. And once your device is in the market, the feedback doesn't stop there. So you should be gathering feedback, doing user testing, and checking everything as your device is in the market through any updates that you've created. Continue doing user testing. Continue doing guerrilla testing. Anything that's in that research column, you should be continuing to do to help you create updates for your products and also help you define the next iteration cycles through, through your thing. And that's the process. So we've taken you through ideation, prototyping with Android Things kits, making final hardware selections, creating builds and hardware bring up, the factory process, all the way to the end product with maintenance and updates, running through design iterations each step of the way. Thanks, Kristen. And so we've talked about today how design is people in context with goals. And it's a process. We can plan, prototype, feedback, and iterate on that process in order to help those people in those contexts achieve those goals. And now it's easier than ever to participate in the creation of physical products um, than it has been ever before. Android Things offers tools to help accelerate the prototyping process that you can use today to kickstart your ideas. Um, processing enables the fast experiment experimentation of rich graphics, and when combined with hardware, enables you to make really powerful experiences. All of these techniques really enable you to make better connected products for everyone using Android things. Uh, you can get started today uh, at experiments.withgoogle.com slash lantern. Uh, you can check out some of the samples, projects, and more at androidthingswithgoogle.com. If you've picked up a kit today, there's lots of sample code over there for you to try out. Um, if you haven't gotten a kit, you can get one over at the IoT Dome. A big thank you to the Nord Group, um, Ben, Joe, and Mike for helping out with this project. Ding on the Android Things UX team uh, for managing all of the intercontinental prototyping that was required for this. Uh, and Chloe on the Android Things ML team for making um, all of the ML magic come to life. Um, please check it out. Uh, we'd love to see you over there. Um, Thank you guys for coming. And if you have feedback, we do want to hear from you. You can do so right here. Thanks so much. Yeah.